I was going to ask what hypnotizability is. Is it synonymous with cognitive flexibility? And is there, I mean, you've already said really implicitly that there is variation in hypnotizability, but what does this correlate to in the brain? Um, we've studied that. We've taken a group of Stanford students, extremely high and extremely low in hypnotizability. We measure them, put them in the scanner before we asked them to do anything hypnotic. And we found that what typified people who were highly hypnotizable is higher functional connectivity between the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex on the left, that's part of the executive control network, and the dorsal anterior cingulate on the right, which is part of the salience network. So it means that for those people, thinking and the and feeling are more closely interconnected, and they're less likely to be distracted because uh, they're less likely to let the salience network impair their ability to concentrate on something. And, and so uh, the functional connectivity simply means that when one area is active, the other area is active. When one is inactive, the other. So there's this coordinated activity in high hypnotizables that you don't see in low hypnotizables. We found that there's a genetic component to that. Uh, and uh, my colleagues and I just published a paper uh, in which um, we looked at a, 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 a gene, the catechol o methyltransferase gene, which is involved in metabolizing dopamine, one of the leading neurotransmitters. And uh, we found that... Um, a particular polymorphism of that gene was associated with higher hypnotizability. Um, and so we actually now have a point of care test where we could take a sample and very quickly analyze whether or not you turn out to be more likely to be highly hypnotizable and then choose that uh, as a therapeutic uh, intervention. So it was my, my lab and, and Dr. Wangs uh, and uh, Jesse Markovitz um, uh, uh, who, who worked together on um, developing this test. And so we now know that there's a genetic component as well as neurobiological signature um, that, that are associated with higher hypnotizability. Hmm. When you started answering that question, you said you take you took a group of Stanford students, some that were highly hypnotizable, some that were not. And this uh, presupposes for me that you are you know how to measure hypnotizability. So I'm wondering one, yeah, how do you measure hypnotizability? And this closely relates to another question that we haven't uh, gotten into yet, but that's of the utmost important. Just how do you hypnotize someone? Well, first of all, Dana Cortad was the actually the lead author on that genetic paper, and she got intrigued by the uh, possibility of a genetic test for hypnotizability. We the, there are a number of measures. One of the scales is the hypnotic induction profile, um, which is in trance and treatment and which we Yeah, you and your it father about, came up with it, right? right? And so it's a, a brief structured test where you give people instructions um, to, after they've looked up, close their eyes, take a deep breath, to let their hand float up in the air like a balloon. And you instruct them that even if you pull it down, it'll float right back up to the upright position. We can try it if you want to see how hypnotizable you are. Uh, we have a hypnotizability test on Reverie too, uh, but that's doable if you want. Um, and there are some people who will respond very quickly and they'll pull the hand down, it'll float back up. They'll feel less control over that hand compared to the other. And there are others who don't, for a moment, they, they don't sort of know what you're talking about and they are less hypnotizable. And you can rate people on a zero to 10 scale of hypnotizability. To do the study that I mentioned, we started out with a group form of a different hypnotizability measure, the Harvard uh, Group Susceptibility Hypnotic Susceptibility Scale. So I gave talks and you know measured hundreds of people, and then we selected the ones at the high or low ends and gave them a second test to be sure that they were either high or low in hypnotizability. Hmm. Yeah. So you you just mentioned. <laughs> testing how hypnotizable I am. And my instinctive response is that, and I think that this is an interesting question and it's, or it raises one in its own right is it is that it wouldn't be valid if we tried to do it right now, because I'm at, I'm already at a, a state of pretty high arousal being in this conversation, but 
naturally that brings us back to that first story you told. Uh, I think you said you were in your residency when that happened in mm-hmm. 1970. Okay. I was uh, a medical, medical student. Yeah. Medical student. And this girl was clearly in a state of very high arousal, but your uh, treatment uh, was quite effective. So maybe the level of arousal isn't as important as I would think it is. Yeah, no, it isn't because hypnosis is not sleep. It's a state of highly focused attention. You're out waking, you're, you're waking them up when you're going into hypnosis. They're okay, concentrating well, very intently. Yeah. In, in that case, if you think it would be worthwhile to see how hypnotizable I am, I'd be interested. Sure. Okay. Let's give it a try. So get as comfortable as you can. You have armrests on your chair there. Yeah, I've got good. armrests. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to give you some instructions about your eyes and are you right or left-handed? Left-handed. Left-handed. Okay. Nobody tried to switch you, I hope, when you were a kid. To the, no. Uh, they did my mom, though, which is interesting. They they forced her. Yeah. It's bad. Does she have any dyslexia at all? Does she? Uh... No, she doesn't, as far Good. as I know. Well, but it's, uh, it's bad. It confuses kids. It's a bad thing to do. You know, you should just go with your dominance, and it's nice that your your mom knew better than to try and switch you. That's good for her. Um. So uh, I'm going to concentrate on your right hand and arm, not dominant hand. So get as comfortable as you can. <clears throat> on one, do one thing. Look up. Keep your head still, but look up past your eyebrows. All the way up. Keep looking up. That's good. And while you keep looking up, slowly close your eyes. Close, close, close. Good. Now let your breath out. Let your eyes relax, but keep them closed and let your body float. Imagine your body floating down, floating into the chair. And while you concentrate on your body floating into the chair, I'm going to concentrate on your right hand and arm. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to take your left hand and stroke the back of the middle finger of your right hand, and you can go ahead and do that now. Stroke gently down toward your knuckles, the back of your right hand, and along your forearm all the way to your right elbow and feel a sense of tingling and numbness and lightness. And now let your right hand float up in the air like a balloon as you put your left hand back. Let your right hand float up in the air like a balloon. Good. Now let it rest in a comfortable, upright position, either the way you have it positioned up in the air now, or you can rest your elbow on the chair if you want. And I'm going to give you this instruction. Your hand will remain light and in this upright position, even after I give you the signal for your eyes to open. Later, if I ask you to pull your right hand back down and then let go, it will float right back up to the upright position. You'll find something pleasant and amusing about this sensation. Later, if I ask you to touch your right elbow, your usual sensation and control will return. Each time you go into this state of concentration, you'll find it easier and easier to do, and you can use it to help you concentrate on what's important to you. You can find it relaxing, for example, by just inhaling through your nose about halfway, hold, and now fill your lungs completely, and slowly exhale through your mouth. Inhale through your nose, halfway. Hold. Now fill your lungs. And then slowly exhale through your mouth. So notice how quickly and easily you can use your store of memories and your imagination to help yourself and your body feel better. Right now we'll come out of the state of self-hypnosis by counting backwards from three to one. On three, you'll get ready. On two, with your eyelids closed, roll up your eyes. One, let your eyes open, and that will be the end of the exercise. Ready? Three, two, one. Good. Now stay in this position, and please describe what physical sensations you're aware of now in your right hand and arm. Pretty much only a little bit of soreness and muscle tension in the outside of my right shoulder, the rear delt. Okay. The rear delt. Uh, is it comfortable? 
any tingling sensation? Yeah, there's a there's some tingling in my right hand. Does your right hand feel as if it's not as much a part of your body as your left hand? Okay, good. Now please take your left hand, pull your right hand down, and then let go. Now turn your head, look at your right hand, and watch what's going to happen. And as you look at your right hand, just imagine it to be a big, buoyant balloon. And as you imagine it, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask if I was forgetting an instruction. No, that's fine. As you imagine it to be a balloon, permit it to act out as if it were a balloon. Be big about it. Can you describe what that feels like? It feels like it's rising. It's rising. Does that surprise you at all? A little bit. It does right, feel so nice and at home up here. Feels at home up there. Yeah. Okay. And that maybe is a little surprising. By, by way of comparison, please raise your left hand. All right, put your left hand down. Are you aware of a relative difference in sensation in your right hand going up compared to your left? Yeah, I would say that my right hand feels like it could be like comfortable there for a while. Comfortable. My left hand didn't really feel that way. Didn't feel that way. So are you aware of a relative difference in your sense of control over one hand going up compared to the other? <laughs> yes, in a sense. Yeah, I definitely had to force my left hand up. My right hand just feels like it would stay up there. <laughs> so you got it way up over your head, and it just feels like it yeah. can stay there. Yeah, I'm not really thinking about it at all. So it's it's lighter than the left hand, is that right? Are you aware of a relative difference in your sense of control over one hand going up compared to the other? Yes, I mean, I I, I definitely had to more consciously will my left hand to go up. But my right hand, I just, it just feels like if I kind of forgot about it, like I'm not really thinking about it that much. It's just content to stay up there. Though my shoulder is getting a little bit uh, tired, but my arm, my hand still wants to stay up there. It was. <laughs> so you're experiencing this change in your sense of agency, that your agency over the two arms is now different. It wasn't before we started. Is that right? All right. Um, now, please take your left hand and touch your right elbow. Okay, now let go. Are you aware of a difference now in sensation and control in your right handed arm? No. All right, touch your right elbow again with your left hand. Let go. Touch the elbow itself, not just the upper arm, the elbow. That's good. Okay, okay. that does feel like there's a change now. Ah, what's the change? Oh, it kind of feels like my hand came back to me in a strange way. That's yeah. interesting. So when you touched your upper arm, it didn't, but when you touched the when elbow... When I touched it, it here, it didn't, but when I touch it the... here, it feels Very different for sure. That's interesting. Huh. So now it, came it feels back like a bit more like I'm holding my hand up there. It does. Okay. Well, you can let it go down now. That's fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Interesting. before you had less control over the right hand and arm, now it's pretty much the same. Is that right? Uh, My right yeah. hand still feels like it kind of wants to do its own thing. <laughs> still does. Okay. Yeah. Well, shake both hands and tell me when the control becomes the same. Now. <laughs> okay, now it is. 
So before you had less control, now it's the same. Did I do or say anything that would indicate there'd be a change in sensation or control in your right-handed arm? No. Well, how did you get the control back? Exerting my agency over it mm-hmm. is how and I what got it. And what got you to do that? Uh, your suggestion. Uh, then you remember what it was? Shake out my hand. Shake us. <laughs> okay. Um, and did you have a sense of floating lightness or buoyancy in your right hand during the test? During the test, absolutely. Um, and um, did you have that sense in any other part of your body, head, neck, thighs, abdomen, chest all over, or just your right-handed arm? Well, I did feel that way when you suggested that I imagine myself floating down into my chair. But after I started raising my my arm, I think it was just in the arm, in the hand. Just in the arm, okay. And I notably did not have it in my left hand when you asked me to raise my left hand. See, now, it's a really interesting thing your your score is seven out of ten. You're you're rather hypnotizable. Um, what I actually said to you was, when I touch your right elbow, your when I ask you to touch your right elbow, your usual sensation and control will return. Do you remember that now? Because what you told me was it was just shaking shaking out the hand, and that did it. So, you know, you, you're an intelligent man. You're carefully listening. Um, But you misattributed the recovery of experience in your right arm to something that was similar but wasn't what the instruction was. And in your case, it was very clear because before you touched your upper arm, but you didn't touch your elbow and you didn't feel the change. But when I asked you to actually touch your elbow, you did. So you dissociated your episodic memory of exactly what the instruction was from getting the implicit information that when you touch your elbow, the control will and that's a, a, a perfect example of dissociation, where it was in there, you remembered it, but you didn't remember that you remembered it. And that's something that you typically see with hypnosis. So you are quite hypnotizable, actually. Oh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. <sighs> Does that tell you anything about my personality type because you you when when we were talking about this group of stanford students you mentioned some of the difference of what was going on in their in their brains that made some more hypnotizable than others so you're on the the mid to upper range of hypnotizability what that suggests is that you have a pretty good ability to turn down activity in the salience network to turn down your dorsal anterior cingulate to not be constantly worried, you know, if there's a loud noise, what does it mean? Is somebody outside doing something, you know? You you can focus. You can, And I can imagine that you're the kind of student that when you study something and you're on track, you're in it, you know? You don't let other things distract you very much. Um, also, people who are on the mid-range to high side of hypnotizability, they, they value experience over thought sometimes. You, you like to have experiences, immerse yourself in them, and later maybe think about what they're like. Uh, they tend to make emotional connections fairly easily. They tend to see things from the other person's point of view fairly easily. So that sound, does that sound anything like you? Is that, uh, a lot of it sounds a lot like me. I, I think I'm uh, very empathetic, and I also get quite absorbed in tasks i generally am somebody that does live in the mind more than experience so that was the only thing that didn't entirely resonate with me but i do like the occasional night of debauchery when (laughs) there you go right you can let yourself do it and there are people who can't who just can't let go that much and you can but you don't do it all the time so you're on the mid-range to the high side, but not the extreme high. And uh, that would fit with, with this experience here, where you were able to reorganize your sense of agency, change sensation and control, and then recover it very quickly. <laughs>